Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so delighted to be joined by the always wonderful Laura Benanti to talk about life and Beth. Um, I wanted to, to start by diving in and talking about the way that you had such an opportunity to develop two different facets of the same character. Um, you know, that, that first episode, the scripts give so much of her present day relationship with her daughter in that shopping excursion. And then we get so many moments of flashbacks and looking back on Beth's childhood throughout the rest of the series. And so how did that really influence a lot of your character development process, given that there was so much scope to work with? I mean, it's such a beautifully drawn character. You know, it really, um, it was great to sort of go backwards, you know, to go into the flashbacks and start there and let that inform the first episode. Mm -hmm. um, I was grateful to have all the episodes to read um, so that it was all clear for me. Um, Cause I was able to, with the help of Amy, um, layer that initial scene with their history. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's, it's a really, it's unusual to get to play, um, you know, someone older, you know, in her, I guess at that point, probably sixties, um, and then sort of go back in time with her and see how she became who she is. And it also gives you an opportunity to really explore the different kind of external manifestations of her as a character. Who is she at this point, um, you know, later in life when she's been carrying all of this, but still kind of has elements that, that call back to that carefree side of her personality as well. And the survivalism that we learned that she had so much of. Um, right. And so, so how did you approach the duality of that side of the role in the two different spaces you wanted to find? You know, I don't think of it as a duality. You know, I think that we are all layered, complicated human beings and we're carrying multitudes at any given moment, you know? Um, and one of the things that I love about the show is the framework, the idea that everyone is just doing the best that they can. You know, it's not like a show where there's like a villain and a good guy and there's, you know, like a a firm resolution at the end of it. It's much like life where you see good people behaving badly and complicated people being really loving, you know, um, it's more interpersonal in the way that life truly is. And there are times where it's deeply funny and times where it's deeply moving and sad. Um, so to have an opportunity to play with all of those, um, you know, all the colors in the palette, was such a delight. And there's so much richness as well in terms of being able to look for details about your character and the things that are said about her, particularly the things that Beth starts recollecting from her childhood, or even, you know, the speech she gives towards the end of the series about yes. her mother and things that she really noticed that maybe she never said out loud to her. And so what were some of the key components when you went through the scripts and looked at the rest of the character's dialogue that also really informed her for you? Yeah, it's, that's such a great question. That's one of the first things I do when I approach any role is that I see what other people are saying about them. Um, and I think the idea that her mom, you know, look, she was a woman of a different time. She was a woman who relied on external validation for to feel worthy. And that is a difficult way to move through the world. And it's a challenging way to raise daughters, <laughs> you know? So I, but I think we also were able to see why she was that way, how she became that way. You know, gosh, one of the things I think about so much is that slow motion pan across everybody's faces as they lose, as they lose the, their home, you know, the life that she thought she had with her two beautiful daughters and her husband was gone in a heartbeat. And there was nothing, she had no power. She had no control over it. And so for her, the only power she was left with was her sexuality. You know, and I think that is something a lot of women can probably relate to, especially of that era, you know. Absolutely. It was one of the really striking things is when she's telling her daughters about, you know, oh, if you want a man, then you need to pretend that you need help so that they think that they are kind of useful to you and can do something for you. Um, and so did you think a lot of aspects of, of that external need for validation really came from what was instilled in her constantly and thinking about what would she have been told in a similar scope when she was growing up? Yeah. I mean, I, I was thinking about, you know, the, the movies that she would have watched, mm -hmm. all of those films say to her, and a lot of the films I watched growing up, the, the, the messaging is be sweet, be pretty, be docile, and then a man will come and rescue you. You know, we didn't have frozen 
we didn't have Moana. We didn't have images like that. We didn't have storytelling like that for our young women. So I think that, nor did we have a world that supported a woman saying, hey, this doesn't feel right to me, or I want to do it differently, or I'd like to get a job, <laughs> you know? So she was doing the best with what she had. And unfortunately, what she had was an ability to make men feel bad for her and an ability to, to make men feel like, wow, she really needs me. Um, and that is not a great lesson for your children. Yeah. And yet it's the best she could do at the time. And that is what I love that Amy shows so perfectly, mm -hmm. you know, that this was not her, there was no, um, there was no nefarious intent. She was just surviving. I mean, off the back of what you're saying about a lot of the messaging that she as a character would have been raised with, but also some of, um, you know, things like the films that you were raised with and that messaging. I actually wanted to ask you about the, the post that you made in the fall about the, the neck injury that you sustained early wow. in your career, because yeah. I thought that that was such a great thing to talk about, you know, in this industry, the fact that so much of it is about saying yes, um, you know, and I was actually interested in over your career and over the arc of time, especially going through an experience like that so early on, how you've really learned to advocate for yourself, because sometimes it's in bigger ways, like saying this doesn't feel safe to me. And sometimes yeah. it's, it's just in small ways, you know, you can working on a show like this and having conversations with the creative team and saying, actually, I think my character would make this choice. Um, and so I was interested in, in kind of some of the nuanced ways, even that that influences the way that you work on sets now. Thank you for that thoughtful question. First of all, um, yeah, I started, you know, I wasn't a child actor. Um, my parents would not allow it, which I'm grateful for, but I, I did start young. I was 18. Um, and I, I understudied Maria and the sound of music on Broadway. And then I took over for that part. And then, um, I just kept at, and I kept going. I, I, um, and when I was about 21, just turning 22, I was doing a show on Broadway and there was a Pratt fall in it. And the first time I did it, I knew it was dangerous. It scared me so much. Um, and yet I wanted everyone to like me. I didn't want anyone to be mad at me. I didn't want anybody to think that I was difficult. Um, and so I continued to do it for about nine months. And first I broke my wrist and then I broke my rib and then I broke my neck. And, you know, I say people pleasing broke my neck and that's true. Um, you'd think I would have learned from that. Um, but in some ways, in a weird way, it almost started a pattern. Um, I think because at that time it was pre-social media too. So I wasn't able to, to speak to the truth of it. And there was like gossip and slander and all sorts of ridiculous things. And so I spent the next 15 years trying to prove that those things weren't true instead of just being a person. Um, and so it really wasn't until I had my daughter, which was five years ago, that I really woke up and went like, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not going to live my life so that other people like me anymore. And it's so interesting. The day that I wrote that post, I woke up and I I was in so much pain. I'll have pain for the rest of my life. I have a loss of dexterity and strength in my hands by about 40%. Um, I have pain constantly. There are a lot of things I physically can't do, um, including certain things I'd love to be able to do with my daughter. And I just can't. Um, and I woke up hurting so much and I thought, you know what, for, like F this, <laughs> I, if there's anyone out here there that can, that will be positively affected by my, me telling the story. I want that to happen. It wasn't for attention. It wasn't for like, Oh, poor me, like none of that. In fact, I had no idea that it would like be picked up at all or, or become a story in any way. And I will say that a lot of young women did reach out to me. Some of them, many of them actors to say, I appreciate this so much because I, I do think we still, you know, we still have a hangover for that. Yes, we're moving forward. Yes, it's time's up. Yes, me too. All of that stuff. And yet women are still being told to be quiet and sit down and be good. And you see it also reflected in not getting hired or who's getting hired. And um, one of the things that I admire so much about Amy is that she tells the truth always. Does it make you uncomfortable? Sorry, it's the truth. 
And that is something that being her friend has, um, I do my best to absorb that. And she has helped me in my life with that. That's really wonderful to hear. And I, I was interested in, in hearing a little bit more about your collaboration with her working on the show, because not only are you getting to develop this really rich and, and complex and beautiful, realistic mother-daughter relationship, but you're also then on set with the person that created your character. So anytime you have any question about anything, you know, she knows and understands the genesis for any character decision, any choice in the scripts. And so how does that make a difference for you walking onto set each day and, you know, kind of like having her by your side and being able to have those types of conversations with such depth? I mean, it's incredible. It's uh, to have the person there who created this, you know, it's, there's no sort of comparison between like, say doing a play that was written a hundred years ago. And you're like, well, I guess it's just, I'm just going to do this, you know, to have Amy there to say like, yes, it's this, or have you considered this or think about that? Or, and especially if it being your friend to say like, Hey, remember when you felt blah, blah, blah about this? It's that it, this is that, you know, that was really, um, special. It's really wonderful to hear. And one of, one of the things that was really striking that her character Beth says about Jane towards the end is, is talking about her mother having lived and created these fantasies for herself, but understanding why she did it and understanding that that was a real survivalism tool for her. Um, you know, and so kind of going back to some of the aspects that we were talking about with your character in the flashbacks, how did something like that really instill the way that you thought about the day-to-day reality that she was harnessing, but also the space that she was trying to create for herself to push through a lot of that? Yeah. I mean, I think I probably would have approached it the same, you know, in that I don't, I've played a lot of complicated characters who aren't necessarily likable. Um, and I always think it's my job not to like lean into like the mustache twirling of it, which this character is in no way written that way, but to lean into what is, what is the hurt or what is the pain or what is the underlying feeling that is, um, enabling creating, this behavior, you know? Um, and again, just the idea that she was doing the best that she could. Was it what her daughters needed? No, (laughs) but was it all she could give them? And did she love them? And was she trying her best? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the speech that Amy's character gives towards the end is just so healing. I can't wait for so many women to see this you know, daughters, mothers, everyone. Um, I think it's going to be a really, you know, healing experience on so many levels because you get to laugh so much, which is obviously heart opening and wonderful. And then you really get to like purge some of that stuff that we all carry. Can't You can't help but carry it. Absolutely. And it's also interesting because with her being a character that that kind of relies on that external validation, it also means that she's not as in control of her own emotional landscape. And there's a moment where she's just kind of laying, you know, her daughters need her, but she's just laying in bed because her partner hasn't called her for two days and she doesn't know if that relationship is still in existence in that moment. And then the phone rings and it's somebody else, but all of a sudden she kind of switches it on again to kind of give this person what she thinks they might need from her. And so how did that really shape a lot of the landscape of the emotional fabric of your character, knowing that it's dependent on the external influences that she's getting. Yeah. You know, um, I feel like that scene in particular was like a, was a a very important piece of it for me, you know, that she, I'm glad we got to see her broken in that way. You know, I'm, I'm glad that the audience gets to see into the, like the depth of her pain, um, and to see how much her daughter loves her and for her daughter to say like, you deserve more than this. I see how wonderful you are, but that mattered less than a person she barely knows calling her on the phone Mm -hmm. because he's a man who can potentially save them all, you know, um, it's survival. It's, it's fight or flight. And it's not something that's within her control. She didn't, I don't believe that this character um, has the internal fortitude to behave in the way 
that I think she really would have preferred. You know, I think that her love for her daughters is very clear, but her ability to give them what they need is just not there. I mean, I, lo- I love how, how clear the relationship is with her and her daughters. And you ne- like you said, you never question her feelings for them. And there are some really beautiful moments that we get to see. And um, one of them in particular that really struck me is the moment where she's with kind of, you know, you're with younger Beth in the swimming pool. Oh. And there's a, such a maternal thing of just holding your daughter in that particular way in the swimming pool. Um, you know, how did you want to approach that particular scene, given how much it says about the connection and that love between the two of them? I'm so grateful again that we had that scene. You know, the thing that I, that is so brilliant to me about how Amy has sort of peppered this character in throughout the series. Um, Cause so much of the series is based on Beth's relationship with her mother. Um, but we don't see her a lot. We hear about her a lot. We talk about her a lot, but the moments that she has chosen to actually let the audience bear witness to are so choice. They were the per- they were the perfect moments. So to have a moment where she's laying in bed and it's it's so awful to see when I watched myself wave away young Beth, I was like, oh my God, it made me up- very upset. <laughs> um, but then to see her holding her daughter, physically holding her, emotionally holding her in that pool and letting her be light and telling her she loved her. I mean, that to me is the essence of Jane. You know, the essence of Jane is so loving. It's the layers of personality that she had to cultivate in order to live in the world that are questionable (laughs) and unfortunate, you know? But I'm so glad that you get to see that moment of just pure love and maternal, yeah, just just that feeling that you get only from a mother. And with Jane's relationship with with her husband and Beth and Annie's dad, played by Michael Rapaport in the series, you know that scene that you mentioned before, where they're they're losing their home, they're losing their possessions, is the first moment that we kind of see any relationship dynamic, and we only get to really see the relationship when it's already in disarray, it's already broken. Um, yeah. But there's there's one of the episodes where Beth calls on her dad to help her with something, and you really kind of see a lot of that charm and charisma that you haven't seen in the dynamic that he has with Jane. And so was that a really helpful episode for you to look at the scripts of to really get that genesis of like what was what was that connection between them what was it that she was really drawn to in terms of his energy and and that charisma and that charm and that connection that he's able to make with people it's interesting what helped me yes that was helpful but what helped me even more is that in some earlier um versions of the script you did see them um having some like fun, like giggling on the couch, like tickling each other moments, you know? Um, And it was right to not have them in the show, but it was helpful for me to read as a performer, just because, you know, you don't marry someone because you hate them. (laughs) You know, I'm, I'm sure there was a lot of love there and they had two daughters together. And then he, I think, brought their family into a really unfortunate space that you just can't really come back from. But I think unfortunately that fracture left her, you know, with two young daughters living in a space she doesn't want to be in. And it kicked up her anxiety and her need to rescue the three of them. You know, I don't think it was ever just for her. I think she always considered that these men could give all of them a better life. Absolutely. And also with the fact that we do get to see that relationship at that particular stage of it already falling apart is that it also tells us a lot about her, you know, people, who are you when you're in conflict with someone, who do you become at that point? And even that first scene where they're losing all of their possessions in their home, you know, her husband's off there shouting at people and she's just there kind of processing her emotion and what it means for her and for her daughters. Um, And so how did you find who she is as someone in conflict with her ex-husband or even in other moments. And what did that tell you about her? Yeah. I mean, I think that it's, it's my understanding and it was my impression that their marriage had been sort of crumbling for quite some time and that this was like the straw. Um, 
but man, that slow motion pan across everybody's faces is just, it tells you everything you need to know in like five seconds. Um, the way he's sort of aggressively yelling at everyone else, it's everybody else's fault, you know? And I think for a, a person like Jane, she's just going to immediately go into like, how do I solve this? And really she only has one skill, which is being attractive and being, and knowing how to like work someone. So she's not that different from her husband, really. If you, if you break it down, I mean, he's sort of like, not that she's conning people, but she knows what she's doing and how she deals with them. And so does he. Yeah. And when we see, you know, going back to the first episode, which is more present day, we get to kind of see that that's still some of what she's having to go through at this stage as well. When she's telling Beth about a relationship and Beth's like, is he married? Kind of not very interested in meeting him because she doesn't know if he'll stick around, Um, you know? And so for you, what was there a difference in that dynamic at that point for her? Because at this point it is just that survival for herself versus she doesn't need to be thinking, okay, this guy could potentially change things and rescue my daughters as well. So there is a little bit of a shift in the energy with that. I think when you start doing things over and over and over again, it becomes a compulsion, mm-hmm. you know? And while I do think that her initial um, desires were maybe a tad more altruistic, I think as she lost touch with her youngest daughter, who like won't even call her back for obvious reasons, um, she of course has to reach out more and more to strangers you know? Um, and I do think that there is a sense of, um, like desperation, you know, as she's getting older and, um, the idea that like, I think this woman just wants to be loved, honestly, at the end of the day, I think she just wanted to be loved and she'll, she'll take it however she can get it. And if that man is married, well, sorry but she needs that love and she needs it right away. That first episode also really allows you to kind of play her in a different space where there's more of kind of a levity. She's not carrying the weight of the world on her shoulders at that point as well. And so there's, there's kind of a different comedic tone that you get to have and particularly with the dynamic with Amy and it's, you know, your character, instead of just saying, Oh no, I don't want a glass of champagne. She's like such an overshare. It's like, you know, I don't drink. I never have, I've got low blood sugar. And so it's really kind of all those details. And so was that a really enjoyable space to find with her within a character and, and all of the comedic tone as well? Oh yeah. I mean, that scene was so fun to shoot. Just the narcissism of assuming someone wants to know why your answer to their question is no. Just like, no, thank you. That's enough. But feeling the need to fill in the the empty spaces, Mm -hmm. that is such a very specific characteristic. And I think it's just so brilliantly written that that entire scene basically tells you everything you need to know about their relationship. Like, with it, I think it's seven minutes. It's a pretty long scene, which is amazing. Um, and you learn so much about them just right from it. Right. Because it's also that moment where you get to speak to the entire history of their lives and their connection and their relationship. And, you know, there's so many things that the two of them say to each other without even pausing, like in the middle of a sentence, she'll criticize Beth's grammar. Then she'll tell her that she's got camel toe and they just kind of keep the conversation flowing. So was that something where you consciously thought about the pacing and the delivery in terms of they don't need to pause to respond to things that they're saying because they've had these conversations a hundred times before. Absolutely. The overlapping dialogue, the shorthand of knowing what a person is going to say, you know, that familiarity, I think goes so far in a show to really sell the relationship. And that's something that Amy does so brilliantly and also creates the space for um, within the context of what's written, you know, Um, she's really so wonderful about saying like, don't wait for, like, we can just talk. Um, We can overlap each other, Um, which always feels so much more natural to me than like you talk, I talk, because that's not unless it's a situation like this where you're interviewing me, that's not really how conversations go. That's not dialogue. Um, but yeah, I think that scene is so brilliant in that you do see that the, these really troubling things that she's saying to her daughter are out of love. Like you can't leave, you have a camel toe. You can't leave here. You're my daughter and I can't let you do that. You know, it's all out of love, but it's still so triggering and awful. 
Well, I really loved the the kind of beautiful complexity between the two of them and getting to watch your performance as always. Thank you so much, Laura. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your thoughtful questions. I really appreciate it.